Shortly after beginning my career as a CrossFit Games athlete, I attended my CrossFit Level 1 seminar. There, I became absolutely enchanted with the definition of fitness and health that coach Greg Glassman developed. In particular, the sickness wellness fitness continuum took hold of a special place in my heart. A couple years later, I began my training to become a physician, and the gap between wellness and fitness in the U.S. healthcare system became gapingly apparent. Instead of maximizing health, we're simply fighting disease, much of which can be prevented in the first place. I believe every person has a right to basic knowledge of how to care for themselves and maximize the potential of their mind, body, and spirit. Following the conclusion of my career as a competitive CrossFit Games athlete, here I hope to bring you influential individuals and ideas that will help you live healthier, more fulfilling lives. I'm Julie Fouché, and I'd like to welcome you to Pursuing Health. Welcome, everyone, to episode two of Pursuing Health. Today, we have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Mike Canales, who I have gotten to know quite a bit in a variety of different ways over the past two years. A little bit of background about Mike. He was a gymnast growing up and at the Ohio State University from 1996 to 1999, where he was part of the NCAA championship team as well as winning a number of Big Ten championships during his time there. And after competing at Ohio State, he has positioned himself in a role of mentorship, coaching several Olympians, and he continues to provide mentorship to the Ohio State men's gymnastics program today. Also, he is a practicing foot and ankle surgeon here in Cleveland at St. Vincent Charity Medical Center. And I first got to know Mike more than two years ago when I was looking for some help with my gymnastics uh, for training for the CrossFit Games. And I happened to find him as well as his wife, Dominique Mociano, who you may all know as a member of the 96 Women's Olympic uh, gold medal winning team. And I came to find that they both lived here in Cleveland. And since then, we've been working together in the gymnastics gym on nearly a weekly basis to try to improve my gymnastics skills for CrossFit Games competition. So you can imagine that when I had my Achilles tendon injury this year at regionals, he was one of the very first people that I turned to, and he's been an amazing help to me. Um, He performed my Achilles repair surgery the week after I returned from the Central Regional, and he's been a great support throughout my recovery process. So in this episode, we're going to sit down and talk a lot about his love for gymnastics, mentorship, foot and ankle surgery. We'll also talk about some of his impressions of CrossFit and how it's helped appreciation for gymnastics and Achilles injuries in CrossFit. In part two of this episode, we'll then dive deeper into my specific injury and our experience in more detail, and we'll also talk about the pursuit of excellence and virtuosity that he tries to express in his own life. So let's get started, but before we do, just a reminder that if you like what you hear, please remember to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and give it a rating. And with that, without any further ado, let's get started with episode two, part one of Pursuing Health with Dr. Mike Canales. Welcome, everyone. This is the second episode of Pursuing Health, and I'm really excited to be here with a good friend and mentor and coach and a surgeon, uh, Mike Canales. So we have a lot of things to talk about, um, and I know you've taught me a lot over the past couple of years getting to know you, so I know you have a lot of interesting things to share with the world, so hopefully we'll get into a lot of stuff. Um, but I want to start out with gymnastics. So that's how what first connected us. And I know gymnastics has been a huge part of your life since you were very young. Um, but can you talk a little bit about what first excited you about gymnastics? Yeah, I mean, gymnastics continues to be a big part of my life. Mm-hmm. But I, along with an entire generation of kids, was inspired 
1984 at the Los Angeles Olympic Games when the U.S. men's team brought home the first Olympic gold medal in U.S. gymnastics history. And I took to it very, very quickly. Uh, you know, as you can tell from my stature, basketball was probably not going to be my calling. <laughs> <Out of> the <laughs> question. <laughs> so um, gymnastics was really a great fit. I had a, a great deal of of flexibility as a child. I was strong. I was a busy body. And um, it's just such a stimulating sport because it's one of the only sports where the rules change every four years. Hmm. I love the feeling of being flexible and strong. It's very challenging. And that's why I continue to do it today at the age of 37. Because uh, I think I'm still getting better. I'm learning things. Um, and, and I think gymnastics kind of has this foreclosed identity of a sport for prepubescent girls and like guys in their early 20s. Mm -hmm. But I have, I have enjoyed the sport. I am very fortunate that I'm able to participate in the sport at this age. My body has held up and um, I cannot say enough great things about it. It even brought me my beautiful wife. So gymnastics <laughs> really, yeah, it, it affects every <laughs> facet of my life. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's a wonderful thing. It, it is, I don't know where I would be without it. And I know that sounds cliche, but I do not know where I would be without gymnastics. It's um, given me so many life lessons, meeting deadlines, goal setting, uh, fear and coping with fear. Um, all of that stuff it, it's it's great I think it's it's the greatest sport in the world <laughs> that's awesome and that's one of the things I think that's been so interesting for me to see is typically people might compete and you competed at Ohio State at the college level and after their career is over they might you know continue to follow some of the big meets or check in here and there but you are still doing gymnastics you're still competing this year you said is going to be your 20th alumni meet at Ohio State and you follow you follow everything you know all the history and you you know so much about the sport so I guess what keeps you coming back I mean you're obviously doing a lot of other things in your life but what keeps you coming back to gymnastics you know to get down to the essence of what gets me or what winds my clock about the sport I lived with it for so very long and, and as a as a kid seven years old, eight years old, nine years old, I started becoming an encyclopedia for the history of the sport. Mm -hmm. And so when people talk about a sport choosing them, gymnastics really chose me. And it has been a part of my life since I was seven years old. And that's not something that I can give up very easily. I'm still stimulated by seeing what the athletes are doing now. It's always changing. Uh, I have strong feelings on where the sport is headed. Some things I'm very happy about, some things I'm not. Mm -hmm. I got into a little journalistic role working for International Gymnast Magazine, which is the widest circulating magazine in the world for gymnastics. It's around uh, 125 countries. And so I, I did some uh, webinars, webcasts, podcasts similar to this, mm -hmm. interviews of athletes. I love traveling around the world to see gymnastics meets live. I love watching it on television. So what brings me back? I, I guess that the gymnastics community never sits still for very long. It's always changing. And like I, I stated before, the rules change every four years. What won the Olympics four years ago will not win the Olympics in 2016. It's just not going to happen. So uh, I think that's what keeps me coming back. It doesn't get old. And, and there are always criticisms that I have, which is also fun. Mm -hmm. You know, it's fun to critique it um, because if everything works out the way that you want it to, there's really nothing to talk about. And so we can criticize or compliment the judges. We can criticize or compliment the scores. We can uh, criticize or compliment the artistic value. We can criticize or compliment the athletic value. So there's so much to talk about and that's what keeps bringing me back. Hmm, that's awesome. Um, and then you've also shifted from being an athlete to being in more of a coaching or a mentoring role. I know to several gymnasts. Um, so how is, how did you make that shift? You know, after my competitive career, 
uh, came to an end in 1999. I, I was very prepared for life after sport. Mm -hmm. um, I, I knew probably around the age of 12 that my gymnastics career was going to be terminal at some point. Mm -hmm. I, I viewed gymnastics and I viewed sport as a small model for life. So I always knew that there was going to be an end, mm -hmm. which is a contrast to some other athletes that I know that go through this jarring dislocation after their competitive career ends. Mm -hmm. But uh, for me, uh, coaching, mentoring uh, athletes was a, a, a valuable void filling role that I had in the sport. And so when I coach athletes of all levels, recreational kids, Olympians, Olympic medalists, um, it, it fills a void and it's helped me with my transition. I think I'm still going through my competitive <laughs> transition here, yeah. you know, uh, 16 years later. But I, I enjoy working with athletes. There's no better way to contribute back to your sport than to see someone enjoy that sport that you've dedicated so much of your life to. I enjoy working with little ones. I, I love seeing them master something. Mm -hmm. um, and I love working with the very best athletes in the world. I, I enjoyed very much working with you, and I hope we continue to, to work together. That, that helped me with my transition. Um, but it, it's, it, it's important. I mean, people look at when they finish their competitive career, you can still contribute to the sport. And when you do that, it really helps. It helps. It's, it's probably the reason I, I love working with residents. I love seeing uh, residents in their training in medicine, mastering a new concept or coming up with something innovative. I love doing the same thing in gymnastics. That's awesome. I can see it. Obviously, you're a great mentor to me, but obviously you love mentoring gymnasts and residents and that sort of bleeds into all aspects of your life is that something that just has come naturally to you or something that you've made a decision that you wanted to fill that role yeah I have to look back probably <clears throat> to one of my mentors who really planted the seed of 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 teaching and mm -hmm. and the passion for being an educator and and that was Dr. Gerard Yu um he was my mentor that taught me everything about how to do surgery, the art of surgery, how to speak to patients, how to be comfortable with patients, how to, to look at patients with ominous either social conditions or ominous disease and, and still treat them like a family member. But he was a tremendous educator. He passed away in 2005, and that was devastating to me. He, he outside of, you know, God and my mom and dad, mm -hmm. he had the most positive influence in my life. So when he passed, I felt an obligation to him in honor to, in, in order to honor his memory, to kind of take the baton as an educator and, and go on and improve either the profession or 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 or, or athletes that I work with. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's always been in me, but. After his death, I, I felt a great deal of responsibility to pick up his role as an educator. And from educating residents and medical students, it, it kind of morphed into how I work with athletes. But I've been working with athletes since I was 12 years old, you know, mm -hmm. coaching little kids. And then I just kept doing it. And so um, I don't know. I think part of it I was, I was born with. But there are certain critical moments in life that, push you into that role um, and it was uncomfortable at first specifically I remember you know my mentor spoke at about 34 conferences a year uh, he was on the continuing medical education lecture circuit mm -hmm. and did a great deal of speaking he was a dynamic speaker unbelievable delivery he was the type of guy that could make complex concepts very very simple and after his passing I ended up I, I was almost forced into the position of taking over some of his lectures. Those were very big shoes to fill. And so his death, in a lot of ways, positive things came out of it because it pushed me to a level of excellence that I didn't think that I had. Mm -hmm. I, I never thought I would be able to lecture from the podium. I, I was not comfortable there. I was very good at preparing lectures and, or helping him prepare for lectures, gathering photographs, working on PowerPoint slides. But I did not think I would be the person at the podium 
uh, delivering all those talks. And, and now that is a big part of my professional career is helping to educate mm -hmm. uh, my colleagues. Yeah. And I've been to a couple of your talks <laughs> yeah. and they are very educational and entertaining. So <laughs> edutainment, yes, as we call exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So let's back up just a little bit and talk about what first interested you in foot and ankle surgery. You know, during my athletic career, I had a fifth metatarsal fracture. I had countless ankle sprains. Um, I had a syndesmotic disruption and a fibular fracture um, my junior year. And I think that's where the seed of curiosity of foot and ankle was really, really planted because through the, the, the injuries and the recovery and my rehab, I really got interested in the foot and ankle. And in gymnastics, foot and ankle injuries are very prominent. Mm -hmm. And I remember as a child being fascinated with the Achilles tendon. A lot of gymnasts suffer <laughs> from those, unfortunately. And so yeah. I thought to myself, is there a way to prevent them? Is there a way to get people back faster? And so that seed was planted probably when I was like 11 years old the whole Achilles tendon mm -hmm. thing. But then through my own lower extremity injuries, um, I, I, was, I was fascinated. I've quoted uh, Leonardo da Vinci multiple times. He says that uh, the human foot is a masterpiece of, of, of engineering and a work of art. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that. And so there's still a lot for me to learn. And uh, I'm just fascinated with the foot. It's an organ of weight bearing. Um, that puts soft tissues in the right positions and it's subjected to so many different forces and it just blows my mind that um, through my mentors and through hard study that I'm able to, to help people regain um, uh, function or improve function that they didn't have previously. Mm -hmm. Well, you're, you're helping me a lot right now. So. Well, I'm, I'm <laughs> thankful for that opportunity. I really am. Yeah. And I want to talk about that more a little bit too. But first... Um, I want to talk about just as you've gotten involved in CrossFit a little bit and learn more about it and we've worked together, how that experience has been for you and what, what you've talked a number of times about how you think CrossFit has brought a lot of positive attention to gymnastics. Oh, w without a doubt. I mean, CrossFit is here to stay. CrossFit is not a fad. You know, I have been a casual observer of CrossFit probably since 2006 when my wife and I started getting involved with doing these gymnastics seminars. And I, I believe that it, it really is here to stay. I, I hear the criticism from people outside the community or even those within the community, but it is here to stay. And, and I am so thankful for CrossFit and I take every opportunity that I can to express to the CrossFit community that CrossFit has brought visibility to gymnastics that it would have never otherwise had. I mean, people now, great athletes, now get up on a set of rings and say, this is not as easy as I thought it was. Because mm. when you watch the Olympic Games, these guys make it look easy, and that's why they're so good. Right. <laughs> but, you know, you have these people that say, you know, I tried a muscle up, and it's really difficult, so I don't understand how you do all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I think it has it is exposed gymnastics to hundreds of thousands of people, literally hundreds of thousands of people that would have no clue about what the sport was like. Because growing up, I'm from upstate New York, and all my friends played lacrosse and hockey. Mm -hmm. And I spent a lot of time with them, but they had no appreciation for what I did. Um, they had no clue about what gymnastics was about, but if I were to go back and, and, and interview them about it, they would say, well, I know about it from CrossFit. Right. <laughs> and so I'm very thankful, uh, to the CrossFit community because, uh, as I told you, I feel very strongly that gymnastics is the most raw of all sports. It's, it's a tremendous foundation for any athletic endeavor. It, it's I can't say enough good things about it, and I thank CrossFit for bringing it to so many people that would would not know anything about it. Yeah, it's it's amazing to me. I feel lucky that I did it growing up, so things like handstand walks and pull ups came easy to me. But it's amazing to see how much people can do even when they start learning 
in their 20s or in their 30s these people are handstand walking and they look like gymnasts it's right. really incredible no it's so. it's, it's spectacular yeah and getting on the rings too, you know, everyone, the first time they try to hold a support on the rings, it's like, yeah. whoa, these things aren't as stable as I thought they were. Instantly people have an appreciation for it. Yeah, that's, yes, definitely. Um, so a little bit more about my injury, I guess. Um, we've talked about it a lot. I, it's sort of just a crazy story in general. The fact that we had been working together already for gymnastics and training handstand walks with weighted you know weights around my ankles and then next thing I know I'm tearing my Achilles and I'm walking in a boot and um, my gymnastic coach has become my surgeon and for me it was one of the most smooth processes I think it could have possibly been it was very seamless the way the whole thing played out um, but I'd love to hear just a little bit more about your thoughts on injury in general um, you know maybe these types of injuries in CrossFit in general? We'll start from the second part mm -hmm. of your question. And, you know, I've heard the criticisms, uh, again, from people outside of the community of CrossFit. I've heard some of them from within the community of CrossFit uh, about the repetitive plyometrics and uh, perhaps the box jumps or, or, or having a series of running, jumping rope, doing these box jumps. You know, I get that, but injuries are a part of sport, okay? Mm -hmm. They are a part of sport, and CrossFit is such a young sport. And when you think about it, gymnastics was at the first Olympic Games. CrossFit is brand new when you look at the grand scheme of right. things. And what I think needs to happen from injuries like yours and to other CrossFit athletes I'm not going to sit there and point fingers and say, well, that shouldn't have been part of it. We don't know. Mm -hmm. But what has to happen, and, and this is very important, is I think that all sports need to sit at the banquet of consequence and say, okay, this happened. How can we make this better? Are there ways to prevent this? But, you know, a lot of people think it's a black and white thing. Well, this is why CrossFit is bad. One of the superstars of CrossFit was injured in competition. Okay. Well, you can't think that way. It, it doesn't work that way. I think what has to happen from an injury like yours and those similar is that we have to start looking at protocols because right now it's kind of like arbitrary physicians and arbitrary coaches are coming up with these arbitrary protocols, I think we need to start earmarking injuries like yours and following these athletes, uh, specifically for Achilles tendon injuries. If there was a way to have a, a database of somebody is having, you know, Achilles tendon pain, we will earmark that person and we will follow them. And I don't have all the answers. This is very difficult to do. But I think as CrossFit matures, that that is something that's going to have to happen, that we start seeing these trends and following these people. And from there, we can help prevent some of these injuries and, and make the sport better and allow the sport to grow. So I am not one of those people that's saying, well, see, I told you so. Uh, that, that's not, I don't think that's fair. Uh, because injuries happen in all sports. But when we get to, to your specific injury, it was, it was I, I'm almost embarrassed to say this because I'm sitting here in front of you, but it was a very emotional experience uh, for me to, to, to see this happen. Because uh, I've told you this, that, you know, at first, my initial reaction was just like everybody else that is a Julie Fouché, Julie Fouché fan, I was, maybe devastated is not the right word, but I was heartbroken because as a, as a friend of yours and as your gymnastics coach, I have had a front row seat to your mission to become the fittest woman on earth for the last two years. So I know how hard you've worked. I know the sacrifices that you've put in. And so it was tough. And seeing that interview immediately after the injury was difficult for me to watch <laughs> because it's that, it's that moment that rarely gets captured. It's that moment where the realization of a chapter in your life closing meets six years 
of dedication Mm -hmm. to a sport and a lifestyle. And it's very rare that that is caught on camera. And you caught the probably the 10 minutes after. The first 10 minutes they kept pushing the cameras away. And that was like, you know, even the delayed yeah. moment. And it was it was hard for me to watch because it was so raw. And But as time went on, and, and even that day, I started to realize what I tell people all the time. And that is I do not believe that anything in life happens as a coincidence you know if you had injured yourself here in Cleveland at a workout in preparation for the regional or the games people would have been devastated people would have been disappointed but you had the opportunity at the central regional to show people in a very dramatic fashion how to move through adversity and how to, and I say this often, not simply go through it, but grow through adversity. And I started looking at it, and to watch you do that handstand walk, you know, immediately after rupturing your Achilles tendon, that moment was so, it was so moving. It was so moving because, you know, I had been emotionally invested in you (laughs) watching this, and I'm like, it was peculiar. Yeah. (laughs) I can't say it was peculiar and stunning all wrapped up into one. Thank you so much for listening to episode two, part one of pursuing health. I hope you enjoyed listening to Mike as much as I do. And we're able to take something away from our conversation. Don't forget to listen to part two next where we dive much deeper into my Achilles tendon injury and what that experience was like for both of us, as well as what it means to Mike to live a life of chasing excellence and virtuosity. If you like what you heard, also don't forget to subscribe on iTunes and give us a rating. I'd love to hear all of your feedback, so please leave comments, ideas, and questions in the comment section under this post on my website, juliefouché.com. You can also hashtag JF Health on social media, and I will respond to your comments there too. So thanks again for listening, and I'll see you next time on Pursuing Health. Music.